So we have several questions on consciousness. Oh. First one is from Jonathan M. Is it true that the difference between ego and witness is that the ego is self as sakshi, plus the error of identifying as an individual, experiencing a separate phenomenal world, samsara, whereas sakshi is self without any such error of individuality and perceiving samara as a mere appearance of self. And from Ashok D., is consciousness a creation of the brain? If not, what proof can be given in support of this? All right. <laughs> Let me uh, take up the second one first, but that's a more general question. Is consciousness a creation or a product of the brain? If not, what proof can be given in support of the, that? If you're claiming that consciousness is not, in fact, a product of the brain. Um, so let me take that up. Let me first give you the direct answer from a Vedantic perspective. And then we'll take up a more general discussion. Directly, if you ask a non-dualist and ad Advait in this question, the answer will be very simple and direct. The answer is, look to your own experience. In your experience, you will find that you are the experiencer, the subject, and you experience many things. What are the things that you experience? You experience an external world, objects and people, living beings, non-living beings, activities going on in the world. You experience your own body, also physical. So there's a, there's a whole world of physical things which you experience. And when we look inward, there is a private world which each of us experiences, a private world of thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, the person which we are. So this is the entire set, the universe of experienced objects. They are all objects. From a Vedantic perspective, they are all objects. So how would you define an object? In a Vedantic perspective, defining an object is very simple. Whatever you experience or you can experience is an object. It could be something outside. It could be a living thing, non-living thing, it could be an action, it could be speech, sound, light, form, taste, smell, touch. It could be something in, entirely in your mind, your own thoughts, feelings, ideas, memories. It could be the presence of all objects like this waking. It could be the vague experiences, the, the entirely private inner experience of dreams. Or it could be the absence of all experiences. That is also an experience, like deep sleep, for example. The presence and the absence of objects are all experienced by what? That which at this moment is the experiencer in itself. That is consciousness. So the two cannot be the same. Very clearly, you the experiencer and what you experienced, the two different things. That's the preliminary, the first step. The first step. It's not even Advaita, this is Sankhya. The differentiation between the subject and the object. And already you will see what we often take to be the subject. I, myself, my body, my thoughts, my personality. They all become what? Object. Are you with me or have I left you behind? They all become object. Why? Simple reason, because I experience it, therefore it is an object. If I experience my own thoughts, my own happiness, my own misery, then my happiness, misery, thoughts, they are also objects to what? To me the awareness, to me the, the consciousness. So that which experiences in itself is consciousness. Often it is mixed up with or associated with a group of objects. What are these group of objects? Mind, body. So normally when we speak and interact in the world, we include a few objects into the subject. My mind and my body, what I call my body and mind, this is included as I myself. We include it in the subject, but it's not the subject. Why is it not the subject? Why is it not really I? Because these are objects, they are objects of experience. So the subject and the object, consciousness and its objects are distinct. From an Advaitic perspective, 
Adi Shankaracharya says, as distinct as light and darkness, as distinct as light and darkness, tamap prakashavad viruddha svabhavayo, in, in the Adhyasa Bhashya, introduction to the Brahma Sutra Bhashya, Shankaracharya says, the subject and the object, consciousness and its objects, are as distinct as light and darkness. You cannot, they cannot be the same. They cannot belong to the same category. Now, bring it to bear on this question. Is consciousness a product of the brain? What is the brain? Is it an object? Very much so. It's part of the physical body. It's part of the physical body. Can it be experienced? It is being experienced. If you see a scan of your brain, you are looking at, at an at a, uh, instrument readout of your brain. When you look at the uh, EEG or the fMRI, you are looking at reports from instruments about your brain. In, indirectly, you are making the brain an object of your experience. The brain is very much an object. To, to a doctor, the, what you call your brain, is, exa is an object. It's just a little bit of living flesh. So from a Vedantic perspective, to say that an object has generated consciousness uh, is ridiculous. It is in consciousness, it is by consciousness and through consciousness that all objects are experienced. That is not to say that the object has, has nothing to do with the consciousness. It could very well be, and it is a fact, that consciousness works through living bodies and, um, and so including the brains and nervous systems. So they are entirely distinct. Of course, Advaita Vedanta goes further. I just mentioned how it goes one step further. Not only a consciousness and its object entirely dis a distinct, consciousness is never an object. But one step further, the objects are not actually distinct from consciousness. Because look at your experience. All objects, whatever you are experiencing or can experience, are all experienced in you, the awareness. If they are experienced in you, the awareness, and only in the awareness, are they really distinct from awareness? Advaita Vedanta says, just as this distinction of object and subject, actually it holds true in dreams. In dreams you are there and you are experiencing many things, people and places and happenings. And yet when you wake up, what do you say? All of that was in my mind. Similarly, Advaita Vedanta says, in this waking state, it's not that you will wake up and suddenly say all of this was in my mind. Rather, all of this and my mind, all of this is in consciousness right now. Is not separate from consciousness right now. And by the wonderful power of Maya, that's what Advaita Vedanta says, it is consciousness alone appearing as its own object. So what Advaita Vedanta does is, it first makes a clean distinction between subject and object. How? from your own experience, from logic, from experience. And then it goes further to reduce the, sub, the object back into the subject. Whereas materialistic science, look at the question, how can you prove that consciousness is not a product of the brain? If consciousness, you are saying consciousness, you the awareness, you are a product of the living matter in your body, in the skull. Then what you are saying is that you the awareness Consciousness is a product of object, of matter. Fundamentally, you are reducing the subject into object. What Advaita Vedanta has done is, first it makes a clean distinction between the pure subject and all objects, and then reduces the objects back into the subject. Reduces means, not that it pounds all objects back into subjects. You just see that it can't be anything apart from you, the experiencer. But what materialistic science wants to say is that, everything must be matter. What you think of as spirit or consciousness or mind or whatever, whatever you can think of, somehow must be a product of matter. So from a Vedantic perspective, Advaitic perspective, this question does not stand. Clearly, because even the brain and the nervous system and the living body are objects to consciousness. Okay. A more general discussion. This question has been raised recently in, in modern science and modern thought a couple of decades ago by a young Australian philosopher, David Chalmers. In fact, he became very famous because he raised this question in, in a conference. It became a revolutionary question. If you Google it now, it's history now. It's called the hard problem of consciousness. 
what he said was coming from it from an entirely western philosophical thought perspective the same conclusion which sankhya and vedanta reached thousands of years ago he raised this question that how can a physical entity have an inner life we all have inner lives right we are each of us we are we are something physically present here you are sitting on the chair which is visible to everybody but also you have an inner life going on which is private it feels like something to be you which nobody else can experience you would say yeah but what's so great about that what's so great about that is this this table or this chair um or this plate here it can be completely described it can be completely understood by looking at it and examining its properties objectively uh you uh, there's nothing more to it there's no dual side to it it makes no sense to ask how does this clock feel inside how does it feel like to be a clock what does it feel like to be a clock no there's no such sense no the question has no no meaning you might say well, how do you know the clock might be conscious inside uh, but it's um, there's no point saying this because we have no evidence to show that there is it does not uh, demonstrate or show any possibility of having an inner life a physical entity this is a complex entity a clock a physical entity like this clock or in vedantic terms an object has no inner life all you can see of it is all it is the more you examine it objectively with microscopes and electron microscopes and all it will reveal more and more of its objective nature there is nothing subjective about this nothing inner to it there is nothing like what it is like to be a clock but there is certainly like what is it like to be you you feel something inside how can a physical now this is the hard problem of consciousness how can a physical entity just like this clock a physical entity the brain and the nervous system and the living body have a dual nature physical nature and also inner subjective nature objective nature and inner subjective nature how and this question has taken on more relevance today when you are generating you are developing artificial intelligence computers which can mimic all our activities they can talk they can interact with you they can do all kinds of jobs they are intelligent because they perform intelligent tasks but are they aware inside even the best engineers of google ibm and all nobody will say that my product my machine has inner awareness no it's just a machine functioning with algorithms it's there and it can mimic all our activities even we have gone so far as to demonstrate intelligence may not require consciousness somebody put it now we are beginning to understand in the age of intelligent machines we are beginning to understand you don't have to be intelligent you don't have to be intelligent to suffer an animal a frog or or um, a little dog out there uh, dogs are pretty intelligent but say a frog or or a, 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 or a lizard or something it suffers when it's hurt and it's dying it suffers it's not particularly intelligent your computers today in uh, the um, artificial intelligence machines are more intelligent than that little creature in some ways can do enormous tasks which that little creature cannot even imagine and yet that creature can suffer but the computer cannot suffer the idea of suffering of pain includes consciousness first person experience there must be a inner feeling of pleasure of pain which a computer cannot experience so an objective machine an object something which is matter entirely can perform many of the activities of conscious beings yet without being conscious and we are conscious how I regard this question as one of the most important questions of our time the hard problem of consciousness though it was asked thousands of years ago for the first time it is making a comeback in this age when science has progressed so much 
we are now beginning to ask this most important of questions. And there are multiple answers to it. So I was very happy to see David Chalmers, who became famous because of this one question he asked. Uh, I, I was so happy to see that here he is here in New York. He is the head of the Mind Brain Consciousness Unit in New York University. And recently I, I met with him and I said, see, there are two important questions in modern thought, in modern Western thought, from a Vedantic perspective. Martin Heidegger, who is one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, his name is mud now because he got mixed up with the Nazis, but that does not detract from the fact that he was a brilliant philosopher. He asked the question, what is existence, being? And now you are asking the question, what is consciousness? From a Vedantic perspective, these are the two questions about Sat and Chit. Questions have been asked, answers are very far away in modern thought. But I'm very glad these questions have been asked today. What is existence itself? Heidegger. What is really consciousness? Chalmers. Of course, I think he blushed when I, if I, when I compared him to Heidegger. But, but it's true. It's, it's, it, these are fundamental questions. Um, it was just the other day, uh, we were at the Institute of Advanced Studies. Professor Jha is here, who gave us a very beautiful... A very wonderful tour. Swami Atma Priyanji had come. And uh, that's where Einstein worked, uh, Oppenheimer, von Neumann, uh, Gödel, good Gödel. Um, there, one of the top uh, faculty members there is Ed Witten, he's a physicist. I mean, Google, if you Google him, it describes him as the smartest man alive today. <laughs> as, as something of, like Google, like uh, Internet will. But uh, it, it, it's compared to the closest thing we have got to Einstein today. Now, why I'm bringing this up is, there's a short interview with him about consciousness. I was surprised, because that's not his field. His field is string theory. But he's obviously a tremendously intelligent person. Very perceptive. Now, he was asked suddenly about consciousness. And a if you Google Ed Witten consciousness, you'll find it on YouTube. Just five minutes. And he gives a very perceptive answer. He says, as we go on studying the brain, see, I've not forgotten the question, coming back to the question. <laughs> as we go on studying the brain, we will learn more and more about the brain. But I think consciousness will remain a mystery. That's what Ed Witten says. It's not to say consciousness is not associated with the brain and nervous system, but it's not produced by the brain and nervous system. If, what is David Chalmers' theory? He says consciousness is all pervasive. It could be, he says, it could be. He calls it a crazy idea. So it could be that consciousness is all pervasive and it works through a brain. It works through a brain and a nervous system. And that's why it seems that it is being produced by the brain. All of you came in through that door. Now, if I didn't know what you were, I would say that the door is a fantastic thing. It produced so many people. <laughs> it produces all these people and it absorbs all these people. They arise from the door and they disappear back into the door. Oh, almighty door. <laughs> <laughs> no, the door has almost nothing to do with you. It's just been shaped in such a way which allows you in and out. All right. Now, going back to the first question. Now, it's, it's pretty easy. He says... Witness consciousness and the ego. Witness consciousness and the ego. These are very precisely defined terms in Vedanta. Ego is called ahankara. Abhimanatmika antakkarana vritti. That which says I, I, I. Say, what is that? Look inside you. I. I am sitting. I am talking. I am walking. I am happy. I am unhappy. I am spiritual. I am not spiritual. I, I, I. This is a function of the mind. This is nothing more than a function of the mind. And remember, according to Vedanta, even the mind, subject or object? object. Should be confident. Do you experience your own mind? Yes. Can you experience your own mind? Yes. Look inside, you'll find. If you can experience it, it's an object. Then the ego, a function of the mind, is it a subject or object? Object. object. This is the... This is the and the um, hammer blow of Vedanta, the stunning insight. What everybody accepts as the subject, all throughout philosophy, literature, everywhere, what is I? The subject. 
Vedanta says the I which is experienced as the ego, the experienced I, very careful, experienced I is an object. It's simply a function of the mind. An object to what? An object to the witness consciousness, Sakshi. An object to the Atman. To you the awareness. You shine upon the mind. And the mind functions in these ways. Ahankara, ego. Chitta, memory. Uh, manas, the uh, cogitating aspect of the mind. Buddhi, intellect. These are various aspects of the same instrument. An object. It's an instrument. Including the ego. That's why Shankaracharya sings. Mano buddhyahankara chittani naham. I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the memory, I am not the ego. Literally, if you translate in English, it will become, I am not I. <laughs> it sounds contradictory, but if you look at it in your, in your experience, it's not contradictory. It's a matter of common experience. Everybody experiences it all the time. We don't pay attention to that experience. So yes, the Sakshi and the ego are different. The ego is a function of the mind. I remember what, what the question was, but I'm saying that I'm asking you to rephrase the question in this way. The ego being an object cannot be the witness consciousness. The witness consciousness identifies itself with the ego, or the ego identifies itself with the witness consciousness, and together we don't distinguish it. Together we say, I. But it is always different. The ego comes and go goes. Do you disappear when the ego disappears? No. In deep sleep, no ego. Have you disappeared? That might be a confusing question. But sometimes, in the waking state, when you are hard at work, fully concentrated, paying a game of tennis or table tennis or something, or a, a doctor performing an operation, or you're absorbed in your research in a laboratory or in your, in your uh, office, you forget the eye sense. In fact, anybody who's a musician, you know that if you're self-conscious, you can't play properly. When you're really playing well, when you're giving a wonderful um, um, performance, you are not self-conscious. The I, I am playing, this thought, has to disappear. That, that's called flow in music. So this I sense comes and goes. It's not permanent. If, are you, do you come and go? When you are playing tennis, and there's no sense of I, you're just absorbed in it. Or you're playing your guitar, you're absorbed in it. The I is not, is not function, is not there. The ego is not there. It's, you are in flow. Will you say you are not there, then who's playing? You are there. In fact, you are more alert than, and you, usually that's a very fulfilling experience. The experience of flow. When everything is going perfectly. That experience of flow is a most fulfilling experience, more fulfilling than egotistic experiences. So, um, Susan Blackmore, uh, who uh, is an expert in consciousness studies, who wrote the Oxford very short introduction to consciousness, I think it's Sue Blackmore, uh, she s compares this ego, the ego subject, to a light in a refrigerator. When you open the door, the light is on. When you close it, is the light on or off? <laughs> the moment you try to check, it's <laughs> on again. <laughs> it's like that. It's like the ego is like that. Consciousness is ever present. All right. I think we should move on to the. One more.